We hosted a live show in London with none other than the legend himself, Roger Smith OBE. This is the condensed version. The full version is linked in the description below. If you want to come to one of our live shows, you can. The next ones we're going to do are in New York and Seattle on the 19th and 20th of April 2023. If you want to attend, make sure to sign up at the link in the description below. Invites will be going out soon, so don't miss out. Looking forward to seeing you all there. We're going to talk to a man who needs no introduction, but in case any of you have had a few too many wines already, I'm going to let him introduce himself anyway. Roger. Really? Uh, <laughs> who are you and what are you doing here? Yeah, right, okay, so I, I'm Roger Smith and I'm a watchmaker based on the Isle of Man, making 18 watches a year. 18? Yeah. So not very productive then? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> How many of you are there in the team making these 18 watches a year? <laughs> well, there's 15, so it's, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a pretty poor level of it is. productivity. Do you, um, would you differentiate your watchmaking to other watchmaking in any way in particular? So we, um, well, I mean, my watchmaking started many years ago working with George Daniels. He was this watchmaker who just completely blew me away. And uh, he used to make one watch years, so really we're doing quite well, actually, <laughs> Andrew. Um, um, he started this very unique approach to watchmaking, which we now refer to as the Daniels method, where one man will sit down and design a watch from start to finish. He made his first watch in, I think it was about 1968 or 69, and um, it's that idea that captured me, and it's that idea that we've taken on in the workshop, where basically raw material enters one door and a completed watch maybe a year year and a half later will leave the other door and we do everything in house uh, that's the key to it i design the watches i prototype the watches and then my team myself and my team we build those watches i remember asking you many many years ago you, you might not remember this but i remember asking you do you have your own roger smith watch do you remember what your answer was? It's probably the same answer today. It probably is, actually. <laughs> um, well, actually, I, yes, I do, I suppose. I have the very first prototype for the Series 2, which we built in, completed in February 2006. It's ingrained on my mind. Um, but yeah, I have that watch, which is, is nice to own. <laughs> if I recall, the answer you gave me last time was, I can't afford one. Well, I can't afford any of the new ones, that's, that, that's for sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so you, you mentioned George Daniels. Uh, for anyone here who has spent their last few years under a rock, uh, would you mind just giving a little bit of background on him and how he influenced you? Yeah, so, um, well, as I mentioned before, George Daniels, he, he made one watch per year. He started in the uh, late 1960s. And he, his, his world of watchmaking began because um, his world of watchmaking was changing. So basically... He started off in repairs. He was a trade repairer here in London. He used to tell me about, he used to go to Walsh's in Clerkenwell. And in those days, this was post-war, just after the war. Um, he used to go around all the tradespeople and buy a string of watches. So a string? A string of watches. So basically, um, they would get these trade, the, the wholesalers, the watch sort of retailers, the parts suppliers, they were a hub for the uh, watch repairs, the jewellers around London. And back in those days, nobody had any money. And so um, everything had to be done to a price. So they would deposit, the jewellers would deposit their watches with somebody like Walsh. Um, they would bag them up or string them up, maybe a dozen, 20 pieces onto a string. George would go into the these places and ask if there was any work to do this week. He'd pick up a string of watches, take them home and uh, start repairing them. And in those days, everything was, as I said, nobody had any money. So everything had to be done down to price. So um, none of these watches were fully serviced at all. And basically he honed his skill by opening the backs of the watches, finding out what was wrong with them and only focusing on that component or those series of components. And he'd do a sort of rapid part job, make sure he's keeping time and uh, deliver the string or uh, string of watches back by the end of the week. 
So that's how he cut his teeth. So I think that's probably was to his advantage because he uh, could very quickly diagnose faults. He had a very good intuitive sort of um, approach to his watches and his watchmaking. So then from there, he then went into, um, he eventually went into restoration and um, he met in the, in the car collecting world, he, he met um, cars and watches often goes together. Yeah. And he met um, people who were buying and racing Bentleys and God knows what, and quite often they would collect watches, pocket watches. So then he got into the restoration of watches. And for many years, he used to uh, repair the, the greatest pocket watches that had ever been made. So by this time in the late 1960s, uh, uh, watchmaking was changing in Switzerland. They were, the quartz revolution was taking place. And George said that these damned electricians <laughs> were spoiling his trade. <laughs> and um, Very true. so he started to focus on making new watches, new pocket watches. And in each watch, he would improve the escapement. He'd make tweaks to the escapement and improve their ability to keep time. And um, his goal was to compete with the, um, these new fun-angled uh, quartz watches, which George said were great, they kept brilliant time, but they'd commit suicide every sort of, in those days, probably three months. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what, what's the point of one of those watches? So, um, yeah, that's, that's how he got going. And I met him when I was a student at a college in Manchester, when I was 17, 18. And um, he just blew me away. Just a very impressive character. So you mentioned handmade watchmaking, mm -hmm. and this is something that I've only really started discovering in the last few years. That there's handmade watchmaking that we all know, and then there's handmade watchmaking. Mm. How did you find yourself down the direction of the handmade watchmaking? Yeah, I mean, well, it was all due to George. I mean, he um, that evening he he gave a lecture um, to the students and. Um, he was talking about his development of his watches and the development of the escapement, the coaxial escapement, which we all know today. Um, and he was just listening to his story and his battles with the Swiss watch industry to try and convince them the coaxial was the <laughs> way forward. And um, by the end of it, I thought, well, you know, I would like to be a watchmaker. Um, at the time, I was. When I finished college, I went to work for Hoyer in, um, up in Manchester, Tag Hoyer, and enjoyed it, but repairing watches just didn't suit me. I was always thinking about the practical side of it and the making side of it, which I really just loved. And um, I then got George's book, Watchmaking, mm -hmm. read that several times over, cover to cover, and thought, well, if George could do it, perhaps I could do it. And that's how it started. Bold move, bold move. Stupid move, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back in the day, yeah. So I'd, I'd really like to kind of paint a difference between the handmade and the, the handmade. Because mm. my understanding is, is that most handmade stuff is really hand finished. Mm. A lot of work is done by CNC, even a lot of the onglage or beveling. Uh, and it's, it's a last pass by a watchmaker and their tools. Mm. What you do is different to that, very different. Care to, I, I, yeah. I don't know how long we've got. It takes a, a year to make a watch, but let's, let's see how long we've got to describe one. So it's, um, so we do use CNC. So, so in the early days I was making pocket watches and I made a couple of watches to show to George. Um, and when you're making a pocket watch, you can work to tolerances of, you're working to tolerances one to two hundredths of a millimetre. And that's fairly achievable with fairly rudimentary equipment. Uh, the problem is when you start making wrist watches, those tolerances move up to three to four thousandths of a millimetre. Mm. And that's when the problems really start. <laughs> because you have to repeat, you have to achieve that on a repeatable basis. So I made for George um, in the early 2000s, I made two wrist watches, which are now known as blue and white. And they're wristwatch tourbillons. They were completely handmade. And they're a challenge from start to finish because you're always, 
chasing this unattainable tolerance. I mean, the watches work well, but that's because of the incredible amount of attention to detail that you have to put into these pieces. Um, and as building those pieces, I, I sort of realised that if ever I wanted to build a future watchmaking business, that I couldn't really go down that route because I'd honed these skills over uh, the previous, how many years was it? Um, 10, 12 years by that point. And um, so we did go down the CNC route and that gives me and the watchmakers those micron accurate components. What's unusual about what we do is that we build everything in house. The only components we don't make for a watch are the sapphire crystals for the case, the strap, um, the jewels, and the main spring and balance spring. And that approach is unheard of in watchmaking today. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so that's our unique approach. So yes, we get the highly accurate components made, uh, but then the watchmakers, again, we give each watchmaker a kit of parts and um, it's then their responsibility to take each of those components and to take it from its raw machine state through to finished component in a watch. And that can take, on some components it may take an hour, an hour and a half, other times it may take two days to finish one component, maybe more. Um, and there are 100 and, gosh how many is there? 150 odd components in our most basic watch. So every single component has to be heat treated if it's steel um, and then finished and highly decorated and polished and so on. So the finishing processes are, you know, we, we black polish all of our steel work, which is where you get a, where you harden a piece of steel and then you grind it down basically on diamond compounds on a piece of tin until this component flashes complete blackness back at you and that's called a black polish and that's something which simply isn't attainable in mass production mm. you'll you can never get that true black polished finish all the gold work again is black polished so it's an incredible attention to detail and um, yeah we sort of combine modern CNC techniques with very traditional ways of finishing and building a watch, and that's why we're only making 18 pieces a year. I mean, it sounds utterly incredible. I can only imagine the uh, the test of patience it is for a watchmaker. Mm. And a question I've always had is, how do you stop yourself going completely mad? <laughs> or, or haven't you? <laughs> no, not yet. No, uh, it's uh, it's. I mean, yeah, I've obviously got the right mindset to do this. You know, and um, and the other watchmakers have. You know, we have had some watchmakers who simply cannot take it. You know, it is too much. They get drawn into this sort of um, sort of cycle of finishing and refinishing until there's no component left. You know, you you have to be able to um, at some point you have to be able to say, well, that is as good as I will ever get that component. And you have to be able to draw the line and move on to the next next components, and that's just down to experience. But of course, yeah, we all have this obs a slight obsessive, you know, um, yeah, sort of take on watchmaking. And whenever we deliver a watch, whenever I deliver a watch, I look at it, and I'm always blown away by the quality and standard that the guys in the workshop achieved. But you know, you're always looking to improve that. So there is this continuous cycle of improvement that goes on and how can we make that watch better and the series six we delivered the first piece in so series two in two th we delivered the first piece in 2006 and we're still refining that watch you know we're still improving it and it's that continual improvement that i enjoy um and you've I mean, it, you guys have got email signatures. Some of you might have BSC honours after that. This guy has OBE. That's pretty impressive. What, what was, uh, what was uh, that uh, whole Somebody thing? said to me, other buggers' efforts. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was it receiving an award like that for the work that other people have done? Yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, it, it was brilliant. It is great. It's wonderful. I mean, um, yeah, to be recognised for that. For, I mean, it's for services to British watchmaking. Um, 
Yeah, it's very nice. I enjoyed <laughs> very, it. Very nice day yeah, out. I enjoyed yeah. it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, it's it's a gentleman over the said well deserved. So there you go. There's there's one person there who thinks you, were, you. you deserved it. Um, you mentioned the British watchmaking and the development of British watchmaking, the pursuit of that. You're here talking to me not necessarily because you've got a whole ton of watches you need to sell. That's pretty well taken care of. People buy your watches yeah. and there are a big queue of people looking yeah. for those. But there are other watchmakers in the UK as well. And for those of you who haven't seen, I'm wearing a little badge here. It says British on it and it's not because I'm a racist. It's because <laughs> it's for the British Watch and Clockmakers Alliance, which is a project that you have been working on with a, with a group of other people. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yes, so the, uh, the Alliance of British Watch and Port Makers, that started, uh, we started having conversations in, I think it's 2018. And um, for a while I'd been involved, um, yeah, I mean, I've been involved with, in watchmaking all my life. And um, I was going to Salon QP, which no longer exists. Um, but I was meeting other people and chatting to them and I was getting a sense that there was lots happening in British watchmaking today but it really wasn't being talked about in, in the media or in the watch media or amongst other collectors and enthusiasts and um, I bumped into Mike France from Christopher Ward mm -hmm. and I'd, got, I'd gotten to know Mike relatively well um, and I was having a bit of a whinge thon to him about this this sort of problem. <laughs> and he said, I agree, you know, there is a lot going on in British watchmaking. Let's try and, um, well, I said, yeah, you know, I think we need to do something to try and shine some light on it. Uh, Mike was hugely supportive. We started having meetings. Um, in 2020, we, we launched the Alliance of British Watchmakers. And... Um, I remember when we, we, we were um, chatting before it was launched, um, we, we hoped we may get 20 people on board. We thought, gosh, you know, forget, no, I think it's a dozen. We were all having bets how many watchmakers, you know, uh, watchmaking companies we may get on board. Um, and thought, we thought if we get a dozen companies on board, we will be doing really well. We will have achieved everything we wanted. Anyway, here we are, um, 2023, we've got over 75 trade members now. And it's, it's been really, I mean, even for me, you know, it's been fascinating because we now know there is an industry out there. We're under no illusion. It's a small industry. Uh, one of the first jobs we did was a bellwether report into the size and scope of the industry. We got uh, KPMG to, to look into the sector to find out what it, what it was. Um, that had never been done before. Um, so as I say, now we know we have a hundred and fifty million uh, pound industry. Uh, we have a project billion, uh, which we're aiming to, and what we're trying to do, well, what we are doing is, is making sure there's a conversation now with the journalists. Uh, we're also talking amongst ourselves and trying to work out how we can all work together to help to promote and grow the sector. Um, and we're, yeah, I mean, it's still very exciting. You know, we're, we're still at the early stages, really. We're also on the verge of having conversations with the educators because obviously we need to make sure there's the right skill level within the sector to support what it is today. And, um, you know, as I say, we're under no illusion. You know, we are not mass manufacturers we are there is no real manufacturing base left in britain <coughs> we've got to be honest about that um, but we're now in a good position to be able to support and try and nurture and push forward and build what is a wonderful sector i mean you're all here because you're interested in watches and um it's 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 been very good for me the watchmaking world and you know it can be for many many other people I heard a story, and you have to tell me whether it's true or not, that you approached the British government about the watch industry, and they said there wasn't one. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you've got your work cut yeah. out for you a little yeah, bit there. But actually now we are on the uh, government economic sector, and we are in conversations um, about 
how the government can support and help our industry. And we're chatting amongst shoemakers and various other manufacturing bases within Britain who all have the same issues. You know, it's all about supply and demand and trying to bring some manufacturing back to, um, back to Britain. And you have to be at the table in order to try and progress that sector. So it's really, it's fascinating. Yeah, really great. And you lot all thought this was free, right? <laughs> but actually, if you want to join the British Watch and Clockmakers Alliance, uh, you can Google what I just said. It's £55 for a year's membership. Uh, I haven't been paid or asked to say this, but I've recently joined up myself. You get a lovely pin. The main reason I want you to join is because you hand sign all the certificates, don't you? I do, yes. So yes. if you... <laughs> you see where I'm going yeah. with this? <laughs> Uh, but I think it's an absolutely wonderful project and I've had the immense privilege over the last few years to discover some of these independent brands and realise that, you know, you mentioned Mike France and, yeah. and what Christopher Ward have done with the Bel Canto, yeah. which I'm sure you're all familiar with. For us, you go, hello, I can have awesome watchmaking for not as much money as, as the other brands are charging. Mm -hmm. And it, it, to me, it feels like not a resurgence of British watchmaking in the past, yeah. but something a bit different, a bit yeah. more technological, knowledge-based. Um, is, is that the kind of the, the thing you're going for? You seem to love the technological, the engineering side. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, I come, I've come from a very traditional watchmaking background. I did a British Horological Institute course, and I used to be involved in the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers, and it is all about tradition, tradition, <laughs> tradition. Um, but actually, you know, as I say, it's been a real eye-opener since, you know, we started the Alliance. And I'd say 99% of our trade members have come from outside of the industry. And they've all come in with very keen business heads. Um, I mean, if you look at Mr. Jones Watches, who's based here in London, he had a, has an art background and he had an interest in printing. And over the years, that has developed into him creating a very successful brand, which is predominantly based on imports from you know, China and God knows where. But he's created a very successful business where he puts his own slant on that business and style on that business. He, he brings in artists to help create all the different dials and so on. And he, he's creating a very unique, thriving business. And that, for me, is exciting because um, we lost the industry back in the um, 1850s and we lost it because we didn't move with the times because we were still trying to make everything by hand and we said no we said no to mass production and that's how we simply lost the lost the the industry so the idea of going back there is just a non-starter you can't build an industry or buy hand making components and um, we make 15 18 watches a year we're a good example as to how you know how not to do how, how not to bring back an industry but um yeah you know and as i say we're under no illusion you know there are people out there who are probably of our 75 trade members are all people who will be really struggling really struggling trying to build watches in their in their bedrooms um who are 100 percent reliant on importing uh, components to create their watches but I started in my bedroom and actually it's in a garage actually I started in a garage and you know you got to start from somewhere so I think if we can all support these people buy their watches and the great thing is you know you you get to know these watchmakers well they're not often not watchmakers but they all have their own interesting story and um, that's what I've found so fascinating about the last few years involved in the Alliance is hearing about these people and getting to know about why they are making their watches and that's yeah really exciting and you know the entry level is a few hundred quid yeah you know so you can buy many of these things so <laughs> I, I, I find it a touching almost that you, know, you make watches that cost a, an amount that I definitely can't afford but you are there supporting an industry that starts at, I think Mr. Jones watches start at £150. Yeah. And they're, they're fantastic, yeah. so it's, yeah. it's really good. Well, there you go. I hope all those seats are comfortable. These uh, stools certainly aren't. <laughs> I want to say thank you, a massive, massive thank you, Roger, for coming and talking to us. Pleasure. Uh, a, a huge privilege. I hope you've all enjoyed it as well. Um, and any last words? 
sign up for the British Alliance, that oh, kind yes. of thing. Oh, yes. All of you, please sign up. <laughs> no, actually, seriously, all, if you could all join, then it makes our life a lot, lot easier. Yeah. Um, it's all been self-funded um, to this point. Um, yeah, and we can do great things with that. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.